Okay. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us here. Welcome to those who are here in person. It's great to see you all. Um, and welcome to those who are joining us online as well. My name is Annika Hohl. I'm one of Greeley PTO's co-chairs for Parent University. And I'm joined by Emily Gray with Foundation 51, who you all will hear from in a moment. The topic of tonight's workshop is understanding our why, advancing inclusion and belonging in our community. And we're delighted to welcome Lawrence Alexander, who will speak to and engage with us on this topic. This event is brought to you by Greeley PTO, Foundation 51, and MSAD 51's Equity Leadership Steering Committee. Before turning things over to Emily to introduce Lawrence, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Equity Leadership Steering Committee who are here this evening. So could you all please stand or wave? Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the district's technology department who are making the live stream, online participation, and recording possible this evening. So thank you all. Uh, this is our first in-person parent university since November 2019, I think, um, and our first ever, I believe, hybrid workshop. This evening, we will hear from Lawrence, we will have the opportunity to do a gallery walk, and we'll engage in small group discussions. Other than the small group discussions, the session will be recorded for later viewing. And now, without further ado, I will turn things over to Emily. Thanks, Hanukkah. <laughs> My name is Emily Gray, and I'm a Foundation 51 board member. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Lawrence Alexander this evening. Lawrence currently serves as a consultant on equity work to MSAD 51. He is the practice leader for Carney Sando and Associates' diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging practice. To date, Lawrence has conducted anti-bias training with more than 50 colleges and universities, more than 30 independent schools, and a host of corporate and community-based organizations. He provides guidance related to board governance, strategic planning, climate assessment, and inclusive hiring. Lawrence started his career in higher education before spending a decade at independent schools working as a college counselor and as a director of equity and inclusion. Lawrence was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, and now resides in South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. He is the husband of Mon Monique Alexander, and together they have six children. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Alexander. <laughs> Uh, to Annika and uh, Emily, thank you all so much for uh, a great introduction. Thank you all so much. And I, I really feel like uh, those applause were undeserved because I didn't have the six kids. I, um, thank you all so much for, for making time this evening. And I thought the best way to socialize the introduction to our topic about our why might be through just a, a vignette of about four quick stories. But certainly, as you can tell, I have no New England accent, uh, born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, first generation private school student, went to Catholic school all through uh, 12th grade, went to an all boys Jesuit high school in um, Jersey City, New Jersey, and then went on uh, to be first generation college. My dad was a mailman, um, and I don't know how folks deliver mail in Maine, but like my dad actually like delivered mail, like pushed the actual cart to deliver mail. He was like a letter carrier, actually carried the letters. And my mom was a um, nurse, and I, I'll never forget. And it was them and, and just me and my sister. And they said, the, you know, the gifts of poor parents are a good name and a good education. And I never forgot how important that was. So um, grateful for them and grateful to be with you all. In a national moment, and it feels like we've been in this moment for years now, haven't we? The iterative, ongoing, substantive necessary, um, inescapable work of evolution, not revolution in education has been politicized, has been polarized, and it seems there's been a commitment to misunderstanding it. So we felt like it might be prescient, maybe even wise, to talk about socializing our why. So instead of lecturing, I'll tell you four stories as an entree into it and see if we just can't get started. Why would a commitment to appreciating 
diversity of many kinds, of being inclusive, that means welcoming, of many folks, equitable in terms of the proportion of which students in our schools get to see themselves both in the mirror, seeing folks who look just like them, characters, authors who look just like them, windows, folks who look different, uh, because both are helpful. And then all of a sudden we come with this B on this journey as you so socialize and you crushed it with it, this idea of belonging, that everyone in a community should feel seen, safe, valued, and centered. Arthur Chan starts with uh, explaining this distillation about DEIB, says that ultimately diversity is a fact, um, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, but belonging is an outcome. And we'll unpack that a little bit later. Four stories, because I wanted to build suspense. So um, for better or for worse, I want to tell you about a, an awesome little Polish man about this tall. Jack is about this tall, Jack Roslowski. Um, Jack Roslowski is the current president of Xavier High School in New York City. It's the largest Jesuit um, boys' school in New York City. Um, Jack Roslowski was my high school principal at St. Peter's Prep when I was a kid, back in the Stone Age before kids had Google. Um, Jack Roslowski was a he was the principal of the school. And I lean on the fact that he was a principal because principals usually don't teach classes. But my principal, Jack Roslowski, cool guy, Polish from Hoboken, about this tall, taught um, my senior class. It was a senior elective in English. And the class was, because I'm building suspense, he taught my African-American lit survey class. When I went to St. Peter's Prep, I was one of seven black boys in a class of 250 students. While having an African-American lit survey class may have not been a big deal to anyone else, it was huge to me. I got familiar with the Norton Anthology. I got familiar with Henry Louis Skip Gates. I got familiar with authors and uh, protagonists and, and awesome folks who looked like me. And the, the class wasn't just black kids, it was white kids too, but we wouldn't have had that class unless my principal, little white dude, Jack Roslowski, this tall, from Hoboken, New Jersey, saw the need. Second story, um, why am I in New England? Oh, I was in northern New Hampshire. Yes, I was. Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Wicked fa, as they would say from where we are in, in Massachusetts. I moved to northern New Hampshire, um, and I didn't know there was a competition. But Maine is 94, I think, in looking at the census, 94% white. Maine is kicking your butt. It's 96% white. They are winning if you can win at that. State's 96% white, 87% forested. That means it's whiter and greener than it is brown. And I went with my whole family to work at the White Mountain School in 2016. 2016 was an awesome year, was it not? And I remember uh, moving there with my wife and my kids and my daughter was a freshman in high school that year. And I remember, because it was a boarding school, there was a young kid who moved up from Alabama and, as, and plenty of great people come from Alabama. I'm not trolling Alabama. He really was from Alabama, though. And um, in decorating his room, he uh, brought out of his bag from home a Confederate flag. And he put the Confederate flag up on the wall. And for him, he had no real knowledge about the connection to the Confederate flag in a poll of opinions or perspectives on the flag. But the school took down the flag. He put back up the flag. There was this perseverating back and forth about the flag. I just moved here with my very brown family from Long Island, New York, and I had no idea about this kerfuffle about the Confederate flag. I found myself within two months sitting in a room like this full of students and one faculty member out of 50 talking to our community about the history of the Confederate flag, racism in America, and culture. Okay, third, third story, third story, third stories are amazing. Um, Actually, it's a story about yourself. So just the adults in the room, and you can reflect. You don't have to answer. But I think it's important for students in the room to think about it, too. Adults in the room who may have been in school, kindergarten through college. So this is your own reflection. Think about how long you went in education before you had a teacher, an administrator, a principal, superintendent, head of school, professor, who was a person of color? You don't have to answer, don't say it out loud, but think to yourself. For me, my first black teacher, I didn't have one until I was in ninth grade, and it could not have been more stereotypical. Um, he was my ninth grade music teacher, and his name was Mr. Jones. Very black name, music, very stereotypic class. Like me and Mr. Jones, like it's okay to laugh, like what in the world? 
I didn't have another black teacher until I was a, uh, in my graduate program in counseling. Her name was Kat, Dr. Kathy Gaynor. Hold the tension there. Think about your students. What is the long-term consequence of not seeing diverse folks in terms of faculty, staff, diverse voices and faces when they go out into the world? I spent 10 years as a college counselor. Guidance counselors, college counselors hold pretty decent stroke in high schools so much as we're kind of the gatekeepers for college access. In 10 years as a college counselor, I was more conspicuous by my presence than by my absence because they were, for many of my kids, not just kids of color, but many of my white students, I was the first consequential person of color in a role of leadership in their lives. So my most substantive and transformative impact was not on my kids of color. They see people like me all the time. It was actually for my white kids who otherwise wouldn't see people like me in those kind of roles. When you talk about our, our why, hopefully what you're hearing is that it's not a zero sum game it's not some politicized, polarized, political leaning. It's asking the question about what type of world we want our kids to live in. It can be true in any populace, in any part of the country, when we do think about Maine, and I can jump cut to New Hampshire, day to day, our kids don't see the world. What then is our responsibility to help them prepare now for tomorrow. I think that's the why. Tonight, what we'll have an opportunity to do, and thank you so much to our Equity Leadership Committee, thank you to folks who have organized it tonight. We've been on this journey. Oh, I should have said Jeff, but Jeff knows who he is. I try to um, hide him in the, uh, I try to hide him in the crowd. Hi, Jeff Porter. Um, and so, have you met Jeff? Um, and so, what we've been working to do in consulting with the team is to really find some pillars, find some places of uh, practice and pragmatism to help us move the work forward. Otherwise, this can feel like super philosophical and airy. And when that happens, um, that leads to more questions than it does answers. So one of the areas we wanted to focus on tonight was professional development. And it feels important to unpack that there. When you think about professional development, think about uh, our classroom teachers, and what kind of training, and if you're, if you're a parent here, if you're a guardian, if you're a student, think about it on kind of the user experience. Conversations as a student I'm having in class, books we're reading, things I wish I had, experiences I wish I had, parents, guardians, support that you wish you had. When we talk about professional development, we're talking about training, learning opportunities for classroom teachers, so faculty, but also um, counselors, guidance folks, you think about uh, coaches, athletic directors, uh, bus drivers, folks who work in the cafeteria, al almost all the adults that work in the community, what are those leadership and learning opportunities that folks need to best serve? What could they do if they had more support in that area? Now, one of the things you saw, and we'll point back to a little bit later, is that gallery walk just outside um, of this space here about reflections from community members about why this can be important. From my perspective, about why it can be helpful, go back to where I started. What made Jack Roslowski so special? Was Jack that much more uh, smart to teach African American Lit Survey? Was his teaching of African American Lit Survey reflective of his political leaning? Probably not. Was he an educator who cared and didn't wait for a person of color to show up to teach kids of color? It was probably that. Go back to where I was in 2016. Was it fair <laughs> for me to move my family for a job? And my job was director of college counseling. Was it fair for my job within three months to turn into the racial explainer for a community of 40 other adults who are collecting a paycheck and not doing their jobs? When we talk about professional education, particularly drilling down to you all, why would this be important? I make the argument that it is actually most important in communities where you don't have the racial and ethnic diversity to, in times, have people from those groups explain culture and explain perspective. It's even more incumbent then. I'll give you an example. Um, I never felt 
um, more male than when I worked my first job as a school counselor. I worked at a girl's school. Uh, women here will understand the following. It was a 612 school, all about women's empowerment. And this was back in 2009. And I had just found out about like women or uh, girls in STEM. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with the uh, program Girls Who Code. But Girls Who Code is amazing. I really do believe the future is female. I believe the girls rock. I think it was awesome. But imagine my office was in the middle school corridor and classes were changing. And I just come off of the website. I've gone down the rabbit hole with Girls Who Code and I had done like 10 push-ups and 14 burpees or whatever it was in my office. And I bust out of the hallway and the girls are coming out of algebra. And I'm like, yeah, the future is female and girls rock and raw. And these poor sixth graders are like, Oh my God, <laughs> you are very big <laughs> and very scary. For those of you who get the vignette, while being supportive, I was also mansplaining and also manspreading. <laughs> For those of you who are familiar with the phenomenon. What, while dealing with cultural difference, do I need to know around cultural competence? That's kind of what we're centering the conversation on now tonight. What we're going to do, and I'll give Tyler um, the floor in a moment, we're going to get into breakout groups. We have members of our leadership team uh, who will help guide us in the conversation. What we hope to engage you all in is some conversation from where you sit. Now, not really where you sit because you're going to get up and move, but where you sit, meaning if you're a student, what are some conversations that I would like more support in in the classroom? Um, what is a topic that we're exploring that... I would like to explore more. What's the conversation we're not having that I would like to have? If you're a parent or a guardian, what are some of those conversations that you wish you were more in the know about? Maybe what are some things your kids are coming home and you're like, oh my God, it would be really nice if I wasn't the tail wagging the dog on this one. What are some things you, you wish that your students had? Now, where it all comes out in the rents or if it's the wash, whichever way the euphemism works, is ultimately, and I'm not prescribing at all as the only post-secondary option to be college or university. What I am saying is that usually when you look at the end of high school and you talk about 21st century skills and habits, you talk about the profile of a graduate, you talk about global citizenry, in terms of skill sets, agnostic to where you go, cultural competence, intercultural competence, talking across difference and understanding culture and perspective, at some point, it's apolitical. It's just good education to socialize, to share with you all what this idea around professional development vis-a-vis -vis needs could be. We're going to break out and do this now for about a half hour. So I'm looking at about 625. We'll give you a, a beat to do it, get you into groups. We'll do this till about 7. Um, you'll get directions in those groups about how to share and add to the gallery walk, and then we'll come back and uh, facilitate a little bit of Q&A, but we wanna get folks up and talking with each other and not me talking at you in the interim as you do it, because you're adults, and you're gonna do what you want anyway. I will be around here if in the interim you're like, yo, but Lawrence, I got a question for you, my man, right now, because you're gonna do it anyway. Um, go into your groups, but if you also feel like you have a question individually, you can, you can do that. But, of man spreading. Let me turn the floor to Tyler. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, this is a different place for me on this stage. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is count off by fives. Uh, whatever number you end up with is the group that you will sit in. Um, I understand that there's some parents here with um, their children, so if you want to stick with your kids, totally understandable. Um, so I'll start with my husband. That's never here, and it's nice to see. Go for it. You guys are a group, so you're good. We'll stay on this side. Five. Go for five. <laughs> we'll go back over here. Nick, you're good. Five. Two, okay. Jeff, you're with me. Four. Okay. You're good, you're good, you're good. One, two, three, four. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. 
So the groups are, um, so group one will be uh, Mr. Curry and Avery, okay? Group two will be Mrs. Sargent and uh, Mrs. Goodwin. Um, group three will be uh, Mr. Porter and myself. Group four will be Mr. Hand and Mrs. Campbell. And group five will be Ken. Where are you? Thank you. Uh, you have a, a teacher name, but just not here. <laughs> So we don't have specific spaces. This place is big enough. Find a space that feels comfortable, and we'll gather that way. Awesome, welcome back, welcome back. I know, I know, I know, I know. They, I know. We're in the groups and we talk about the things and Jeff makes all the campaign promises and then Lawrence comes and he breaks it up like, come on, man. We're fixing the world and doing things. Um, so of the um, opportunities we have now, um, I wanna make sure that folks kind of know what, what to do now for a moment. We uh, will have all of the awesome documents that you all put together as the, the uh, and thank you so much to the equity uh, leadership team who have been um, scribes and have been jotting that. They'll have those and they'll be here. I believe, as Nick told us earlier, they'll be added to the gallery walk just outside. So we'll take a beat in a moment because I also believe that there was an opportunity folks wanted just for folks to be able to socialize here. So this is just me pulling you back for a moment to give them an opportunity. I'm like your YouTube commercial. Dun, dun, dun. Um, but nah, so they're gonna do that, add that to the gallery walk, you're all gonna socialize. Um, just some of the feedback. A couple of thoughts, just as I've been popcorning in and out of groups, and so this is just to share the conversations with you all. You know, what has been um, appreciated is that you all have certainly led with uh, courage and, and candor. Um, meaning, you know, there's no value in the echo chamber of like, yeah, all ideas are good ideas. No, some ideas are probably terrible. Um, and so in fact, many are. Uh, but you know, folks have been really uh, courageous about, is this a need for us? If so, how? If so, why? Can you give us some texture? Um, I think folks have been really thoughtful about what relative to professional education and learning for our faculty and staff uh, makes sense developmentally. Like what's important K-4, um, K-5, what's important in middle school, what's important in high school. Um, I think the question has been important and nuanced. You know, there's some trainings we just hear over and over and over and over again. Do you really need that again? Take implicit bias as an example, like, sheesh, haven't we the, over the last couple of years been implicit bias to death? I know I have. Um, that's what I get tapped on mostly to do. Um, and yet, I think of the use cases we discovered there's some ways in which implicit bias just continues to 
to show up. But, but what does that mean? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a study done probably about six years ago in hypotheticals given just by teachers, whether it's word problems or hypotheticals in a classroom of gender mentions, that probably more than 75% of gender mentions when given a hypothetical are male. So if it's like this professor, this mechanic, this teacher, this physician or whatever, the next thing after that is like he, his, him, as it were. So you can have bias just kind of in who you usually present as critical, leading, et cetera. When you kind of take, um, and I know again, it feels slight, but if you're in a classroom, it's different. Um, most of our addresses to the classroom or to a group, and don't feel bad if you did it, I do it all the time, I mess it up. Um, are usually uh, male and gender. So it's like, hey guys, oops, except you're all my guys. Um, so, you know, hey friends, hey travelers, hey, you know, whatever it is. So I'm sure, um, another one is language. I'm sure in a classroom where kind of English is, is centered, um, you know, you've seen some of the hyperbole on TV where there's those teachers yelling to kids like, speak American. Speak American, that sounds very weird. Uh, you mean speak English. Um, or what we uh, see and through bias, we censor English as academic language. So we'll say then, hey, here during the school day, we're gonna speak English because English is academic language. Well, what message does I give to our English language learners? What, is it, what, what, what does it, uh, message does it give to students who are very fluent in other languages in addition to English? Last one on implicit bias. This is just about the nuance, giving folks time to get these up. Now, are these gonna be here or are they gonna be outside? Is this gonna be? No, no, I just wanna know. It's, it's cool. Ta Listen, it's like, a, it's like a Bob Ross painting. Some of you all don't remember Bob Ross. A tree can live anywhere in your world. Just wanna, uh, is it gonna be here? You wanna put it back? All right, so. Do it while I do this. Okay, cool. Um, some of you all are young enough to know Bob Ross. A tree can live anywhere in your world. So we'll put those there. But quick poll. So those of you taking a language other than English, I bet if I were to ask you about what category of classes those were, for the most part, you'd probably say the F word. I know we have young people here. F word is foreign. Yeah, let's well, kick me out. Um, foreign, right? We would say foreign languages. But it does raise the question, foreign to who? Because if I'm French, then it's not foreign to me now, is it? So we'd say world languages. So there are many ways in which the, um, I think professional education is important. In a moment, you'll go out to the, to the gallery walk. The other thing I would say too, sometimes we can feel the fatalism of kind of the ethnography of the place that we're at. So we could say, listen, why in the world would there be this need for cultural competence, this ability to talk across difference? Maine is 94% white. New Hampshire is 96% white. What happens if the neighborhood changes? Now, this is a shout and a nod to young people whose worlds are going to look way different than us old people. But I'm in awe. You know, I happen to be fortunate, and I know it probably changes in some of you all's professions. I now, at 41, have a job that's remote and virtual. So where I live is uncoupled from where I work. But for their generation, that's going to be normalized. So what happens when people don't have to work in Maine to live in Maine? What, what, what happens when our neighborhoods and demography changes and the workforce is separate apart from the real estate market? We're coming into a world where the neighborhood changes. And so this is a matter of evolution, not revolution. So wanted to pause for a moment. In a moment, you all can go and take the gallery walk. When you finish, and as you do that, you all can talk and uh, Annika, uh, Emily, I don't know if there's any announcements kind of from you all's end, but you all can do that when we come back from that. We'll do that for maybe about 15 uh, minutes or so. Folks can kind of stretch their legs, take a look at what's written. Uh, we'll come back and it's just, we'll finish with a Q&A. You all can, I'll sit center stage. Is this adjacent to center stage, wherever center stage is? Somewhere around here and answer any questions or hear any extemporaneous thoughts folks have. Of directions, um, folks can ask me questions now, but we'll go from here to that gallery walk. Um, feel free to use the facilities, take care of yourselves, but I'll call us back in about 15 minutes for a, a Q&A, but I think it'll be helpful because you've only been in the group that you've been in. Oh, and friends virtually, you're gonna have to imagine it. There were great things. We ended racism and homophobia and sexism. You should have been here. <laughs> Incentive to come next time. I remembered you in the name of being inclusive. I remember you. Um, hang out, it's like three of you anyway, um, but when you all, Two, they're leaving. So um, <laughs> I can't see the counter from here, don't look. Um, 
So, but go, I'll call you all back in 15 minutes. I think it's good to get up, connect with one another, see what's written just outside the door, and we'll come back. Please, as you're thinking about answers or they start to, to, um, to buffer now, if you need to write them down, I'll answer all questions when we come back. But take about 15 minutes, and we'll come right back. Uh, folks online being able to uh, share questions or feedback. So I'm sure that the smart folks up there and the tech team um, and uh, Nick will figure out how to source questions. As people are coming back, thank you all so much. Um, the question was raised earlier, which, which I hope was helpful. And Jeff is uh, around here somewhere. I'll wait till he comes back to answer the question. But, um, you know, tonight is really a, a step in the work together. You know, I am, I am working with your district, or have been working with your district throughout the year. We're still continuing work. And the big picture is to really um, do what I call, a, in the spirit of not adding too many big words at the end of the night, um, operationalize um, your equity, inclusion, and belonging work. So much of this work, unfortunately, is a bunch of talking head, philosophical filibustering. Um, I have a mentor who says that when all is said and all is done, more will be said than will be done. Boy, is that annoying, especially in 2022. So what we want to try to do is put some walk to our talk. So of operationalizing it, that's kind of what we're doing. So tonight it's been socializing. Welcome back. We've said great things about you. Um, but, you know, really tonight is uh, about taking that step and operationalizing our work. So you'll see kind of one of those operational pillars, as it were, is really thinking about professional development. And you all have been sharing some really insightful questions as well as feedback. I was waiting for Jeff to get back because folks were asking. I thought it was good, but I figured I'd wait for Jeff to get back. Um, maybe, and you'll all be able to share feedback later so you can be discourteous when I'm not around. Um, but folks are like, oh my God, how long are you gonna be here? I was like, I don't know, ask Jeff. Maybe again next year? Jeff, we like it here. Um, <laughs> No, but really. But the, uh, the idea is we really want to drill down on tonight to certainly trying to, to build some understanding in, in the world of the anticipatory anxiety around this work. So, you know, starting where we started with Ar Arthur Chan, saying that diversity, you know, that's, that's really just the facts, the, no, the statistical and numeracy of difference. Um, and the reason it doesn't mean a lot is because you can have a lot of racial and ethnic diversity and a culture still be racist. You can have a lot of uh, women in a community and a culture still be sexist. You, you, you get the idea. So who we have isn't so much the prize, it's what we do with who we have. And that's why equity, and I think the question came before, maybe it isn't by folks who are here or online, but there's this, who knew of third rails that equity was such a big deal? So I figured I'd take the uh, 45 second TED Talk version on it. Um, Equity versus equality. Um, equality may say that um, everyone should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Equity reckons with the idea that some of us don't have access to the shoe store. Some of y'all get that when you go home. Um, Tim Wise says of privilege that, um, of privilege, some of us are born on third base and believe that we hit a home run. Equity reckons with the fact that some of us, through no fault of our own, were born on third base. Uh, but there are some of us who don't even know where the parking lot is. So equity deals with um, historical access to education, to belonging, to transportation. If you have a student, and my son, uh, Elijah, who's 10, um, he has a 504, I believe it's a 504. He, um, has, a, he has executive functioning um, challenge. I tell folks he's an he's a awesome musician, but he'll forget all of his instruments at home. So uh, real rap, legit. And so... You know, if you have a student who's not, who's um, neurodiverse or who learns differently, you're the first person who will call nonsense to, for someone to say that, you know, all people learn the same. That's not true. 
And so when you think about places of access, that's really what equity is. So tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend, equity. Um, inclusion is really the width of our institutional and community embrace. And so the challenge, while race is a huge visible uh, marker of difference, one of the first ways in which we've politicized and legalized um, segregation and separatism in our country, it's one dimension of difference, but not the only. So when we just winnow down to race, our embrace is smaller. We expand our embrace to include gender and sexual orientation. We uh, widen our embrace to include socioeconomic status, et cetera. So inclusion is really how inclusive <laughs> our inclusion is, but belonging. Um, that from the youngest of us, I miss being your age. My knees didn't hurt. <laughs> um, to the, uh, now, now, now I'm in a bad spot. Because then I would say the youngest of us to, the, to, the, to those of us who are the most young at heart um, should feel like, <laughs> and then your heart don't feel that way, um, should feel like we belong. So, you know, that's kind of the meaning. We drill down on professional development. Just wanted to give you all enough time to get in and get settled. We have, what time do we have? Oh, whew. I thought it was, and okay, so good. Whew, we have about a half hour remaining. That means I marshaled your time well um, to be together and we don't have to stick to that. But wanted to hold the space literally and I think there's the podium mic there. Um, and, and we might be close enough for, for people to call out. The reason I don't like calling out, and again, I've learned it about ne uh, neurodiversity, is even if you can hear yourself talk, I make no assumptions about people's ability to hear um, relative to auditory differences or auditory delays. So I would just ask you for the sake of other folks, that is, that is a mic, yes, thank you. So there's a mic down here and then there's a podium mic there. But if there's a question, comment, just something you wanna share here, please feel free to take the, um, the mics as it might be and you might have seen with conferences. Um, you may start to, like many folks will feel like they have a question, which is cool, just make a line and you can just wait to ask after another. But um, in the spirit of shutting up and sharing air with you all, cause you all are the, tax paying, awesome folks who are here. Questions from your groups or thoughts that come, questions for me, if you so have them, you can come here and grab the mic or you can come to the uh, podium mic here. It'll only be awkward with me standing here until you raise a question, so. <laughs> uh, hi, Lawrence. Thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned a few times about how Maine is one of the whitest states. I often find that we use that as, as an excuse in not working harder, especially in our hiring practices, in our businesses. I don't know what the numbers of the school district are, but I would expect that they mirror our community. How can we do a better job of reaching outside of our community to diversify our workforce? And maybe that's a whole other consulting contract for you, because I know you do executive search too. But um, you know, how, how can we not use that as an excuse. Yeah, I really appreciate the, uh, the question. And I would say of all things, we are, our communities are our mirrors in so many ways, particularly when we think about folks who reside here who are also then by that, taxpayers who are then by that, folks who send their, their children here. We, we are who we are in that regard. Um, I agree with you. When we come to our workforce, there is no excuse about why we can't affect the structures. And make sure, make sure you'll hear me carefully. Um, there's no reason that we can't affect the structures and address the culture to put us in a position to diversify our workforce. If you didn't hear me clearly and you're committed to misunderstanding, you would leave hearing me say he's a fan of affirmative action. You didn't hear me say that. Um, you would leave hearing he said, that he said, oh, it's in our EEO statement. Nope. You would leave um, hearing me say that it's about a quota. Nope. It's about environmental safety and the structures and the conditions and, frankly, the effort and the budget to be in a position to make more inclusive hires. So I, I agree. And, I, you know, I said it earlier, but think about for your young people in particular. And I have, you know, six of my own children, so I think about kids with care. Um, What's the long-term effect of not seeing a diverse panoply of adults in your classrooms? I'll jump cut from Maine and from good folks in public schools because it's all of us at independent schools who are the sociopaths anyway. Um, you know, I worked at a bunch of boarding schools. I have wealthy domestic kids from many backgrounds who have more diversity in their domestics than they do in the folks who have educated them. 
it doesn't in and of itself, right, make you any of the isms. But man, what if the first time that you see someone of color is when you hire them? They're more conspicuous by their presence than by their absence. And I'll double down on your point. Maine, though I usually, in other audiences, but I know I'm, a, I know I'm on the away team, I usually troll the NESCACs. Not here, relax. <laughs> but like, your colleges and universities have many students from many backgrounds in them. You can't hire them. Listen, don't hire from around the world. Hire from within your state. How, hire out of your college universities. So we have in education, zero excuse. But I'll actually jump to a structural opportunity because it's actually under the area of professional development. Um, what if we, and, and I'm going to be doing this, I don't know if you all are familiar with um, MSMA, uh, the Main School Management Association, and Eileen, uh, King and Steve Bailey. We've been doing the Cultural Competence Institute for a couple of years, and it's been a series of professional education for Maine educators around the country for the last two years, uh, around the state for the last two years. Next year, we're actually dealing with one focus, and we're going to work on hiring fairs throughout the year. So imagine, because you should do it, we're signing Jeff up right now. Um, but imagine if your district was a part of other districts in Maine that got on the board with saying, on board with saying, listen, in graduate education programs, undergraduate education programs, <gasps> maybe kids in high school, we started talking about pathways into the education profession. We started to engage <gasps> people from away, what, PFAs, um, and started to introduce people to it. I believe of things we could do well, quickly, inclusive hiring is one of them. The only footnote I would add and this is to leave you all to your own um, uh, main tea to talk about. Um, I did work with RSU 21. Okay, uh, Kennebunkport, uh, uh, Bunkport, Maine. Y'all don't. Y'all are not as coy as you play. So I worked a couple of years ago with uh, Maine, and they, I mean, with with uh, with RSU 21, and they made history. What, Dr. Terry Cooper? They hired. Okay, y'all are, are waiting. They hired their first black female superintendent in the history of the state of Maine. <gasps> and guess what they found out? <laughs> How racist their community is. <laughs> you get the idea. Let's be inclusive in our hiring. Let's also think about the culture in our community. Because where you put hiring before culture Folks like me become the proverbial canaries in the coal mine. So yes, inclusive hiring, yes, we can do it quickly. We should first assess culture. Y'all knew that about RSU 21, though. Don't act like I just told y'all. Mainers talk. Um, awesome, thank you for getting us started. Others, see, participation hurt no one. Now y'all are hitting Google. Who's Terry Cooper? She's amazing, though. How do you think our community would have changed if there were more black educators? We'd be doing more of this. You know, I have to tell you. Um, tell me your name again. Marco. Marco. Um, I, had, I work with a lot of students in New Hampshire, and um, they go on to college. And they end up doing, like, research papers about culture, about difference, and they end up calling me, which is, which is cool. Um, or finding me on Instagram. And we often talk with them in college about conversations we had in high school. Now, I have to tell you, when they were in high school, I loved them, but they were not very inspiring. I, was talk, I would talk to them on end until I was blue in the face, and I didn't think they were listening. Then they go off to college, and they refer to some of the conversations we had then. Um, I, I think that if we had more educators from all kinds of backgrounds, we would actually engage students from more kinds of backgrounds. But I think to answer your question, what would happen sooner is that when you went on to, and I believe it's fifth grade next? Yeah, so when you go on to fifth grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth, you wouldn't be um, surprised to see someone like me across from you in a classroom like the one that you're in. So uh, yeah, I think it's helpful, but I think it's helpful for everyone. Um, I think we very narrowly, not you, because you all are smart, you are too, and I like your Nikes. Um, I, sneakers are my thing. You haven't seen my virtual, you haven't seen my background in my office, but they're all cakes, kid. Um, I think we have a very narrow idea, Marco, about who diversity is good for, that it's maybe good for some of us. It's actually good for all of us. 
But yeah, if, if we had more educators of more backgrounds, we could do more of this, which would be awesome, because y'all are awesome. Tell your mom she's awesome, too. Yeah. Give her a raise. Others, now I have to get up, because then the virtual people can't see me, and they probably logged out already, too, so it's fine. You're fine. Ver <laughs> Zoom, Google. So um, in our group that was on the stage, you, since you were sitting on the stage, we started to just touch on something that I would love to hear a little bit more of your opinion on, which is the, the special event, the special day uh, to highlight black writers or the, the, the month or whatever versus just making it, or, or I think Jason said organic um, and, and subtle, but not in a you know, seditious way, uh, but just like, well, like, what is your thought on that, that balance of highlighting things versus making sure that it's just part of who we are as a culture? Yeah. Um, and it's a good chicken or egg or vegan options question. And this is about like, um, you know, uh, days where we highlight women in leadership or people of color in STEM or we kind of spotlight culturally. You know, I certainly am for the amplifying of voices. I also understand how we can otherize and create a novelty of. So I am definitely with synthesis so that we can, um, we, we can see it uh, as our culture as woven together. Because I think when you spotlight it in that way, it's still like, and now a break from our regularly scheduled education. And here we go with da -da 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 -da, we tap dancing in, right? Um, but how do we synthesize it together? If we were to spotlight, though, I would want to talk about the conditions that made it so. You know, one of the things in, in, um, in, 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 in your generation, young people, that I have zero tolerance for. And there are very few things I have zero tolerance for. But in, like, 2022, I have zero tolerance for firsts. The first female blah, blah, blah. The first queer blah, blah, blah. The first black, oh my God, in 2022, really? And so should we come across some of those spotlights, I want to now have a bigger conversation about why. So if you take um, the movie, and you should see if you haven't hidden figures about the black women um, that were tickled behind the scenes and NASA brilliant mathematicians. So did women just become smart in math then? Right, so now I want to know about why they've been, been held back so long. Um, yeah, do I want to spotlight Paul Robeson? Sure, I mean, he's from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey, it works. But I also want to talk about his white teammates that stepped on his fingers and broke his fingers when he played, uh, when he played uh, football, and he played nonetheless. You know, my son, he's 10, he plays baseball. I've never wanted to slide my kid before across the field. Um, we watched 42. Um, uh, Chad McBoseman is about Jackie Robinson, and he was, uh, my son was inspired, and he's like eight. He, he's 10 now. He's like, Daddy, I want to be Jackie Robinson. No, you don't. <laughs> in 2019, you're going to integrate baseball in South Dartmouth. No, you're not. <laughs> and so do I want to spotlight and amplify? I'd rather synthesize so that it's, it's woven into the fabric. But if we do spotlight, I don't want to just spotlight the... The, uh, the tree that's grown, I want to talk about the garden, the conditions that made it so late for it to bloom. So, and honestly, that's not really wise. That's just truth and reconciliation about talking about the, um, the systems of oppression. That's 401. I'm trying to keep 101 tonight. But yes, that's a good question. Others, we, ha we, ha we have about 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and then I'll make sure to give it to Annika. start by saying I'm a retired educator and we were uh, yeah <laughs> well that's right and I was like we were so smart you know 10 years ago before we had the idea of cultural appropriation and critical race theory and we didn't have to I didn't have those things to deal with and as I think about the educators today and how they're dealing with that I do my heart goes out to the educators today that need to try to work around the political 
issues that they're dealing with. And I guess my question to you is, how are you going to support, ha <laughs> ha just you on your own, support the staff as they work through these really challenging times? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and thank you for that, because there, there's really no moment that we're at in our current history that we haven't been at in other moments of history. In any moment of brutality related to identity, there's been the prick of American consciousness. There's then been the unifying and the gathering of affected people and allies towards some vestige and some measure of social change. Hold your breath, <gasps> met by backlash, and here we go being polarized again. That is a cycle in American history. And then the smarter we get, the more we put names and labels on things only to otherize them and make them taboo. You know, I tell folks, I was like, listen, man, it, you know, when I, I'm 41, when I was a kid, it was not, I didn't grow up wanting to do DEI. I was a black kid from Jersey City. My parents were from Georgia. We called the surviving white people. You know what I mean? Like, oh, and I mean that literally. My parents were born in the Jim Crow South. I don't know if y'all are familiar. I'll hold the tension there because I got really uncomfortable, but you should know what my experience was like. I grew up in Georgia. I mean, in Jersey, but we drove to Georgia every summer. And when you're black in the 80s and you're driving from Jersey to Georgia, my dad was the only driver my mom never learned. It was me and my sister. You had what they call drive through cities and states. In other words, if you were black, my dad said, listen, he didn't care how much money he had to spend in gas, no matter what the price was. There were certain cities and certain states that you did not stop if you were black. Foresight, Georgia comes to mind. There were some places along the way that I knew as a young kid that it was not safe to be black. And it wasn't because there were other black people there who might harm you. I learned that in the American South that there were younger white kids who could call my uh, grandparents by their first name and my grandparents had to call them by their last name. I was not calling it DEI then. It was black safety in white spaces. So to your point, some of this work has been age old. But I think we've gotten so educated, so sophisticated, we've made it so politicized that we've lost the, the sinew and the muscles that we've had this conversation in before. You know, re remember, and maybe it was Catholic schools, but like, remember when educators could actually educate your kids? How many, how many of y'all were like left-handed, but your, te your teachers made you right-handed? Oh, Catholic schools, they were great, right? But it's this wave nouveau. I, literally, there was a time where you dropped your kids off in school and they went off and learned and they got educated and then you came home. You never, once with, went, in, you never went with them into the school or asked questions about the curriculum. And I'm not suggesting that you live at that arm's length. But somewhere along the line, we've crippled teachers of the one superpower that all educators need. Their creativity and their bravery. I don't want to live in a world where two things happen, where police don't police and educators don't teach. And we're living in a world where both happen. That got really deep. That was a good question, though. And I'm trying to be lighthearted to send y'all home. But um, that was really good. I think we may have room for one more question. No pressure on your question. It just has to make a tectonic shift and change the world. And then I'll make sure to, um, to Annika to get to you. And you wrote it down. That is the way to remember it. I did. I like your scarf, too. That is, oh. I, I am believing in spring now because of your scarf. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, first, actually, I wanted to say that as a parent, I'm actually very grateful to, for the staff and the admin for inviting us to collaborate on professional development because you're inviting us into your territory. And I didn't mean for that to kind of segue from what you said. But thank you, because you are, it's brave and courageous to let other people come in and sit so vulnerably to listen to us. And it was greatly appreciated. What I want to know next as a parent, and when we talk about it with our students or our children at home, what process will you recommend all of the parties who develop professional development in our district? What do they need to go through to synthesize these lists to advance inclusion and belonging for everyone? Really good question. And honestly, you know, I know I presented with hyperbole, but that's actually the question to end on. You know, what, what now and what's the process? Um, I'll start with what it's not. And I think some folks said it earlier. It's, it's not with the shortcuts. You know, the shortcuts would be, hey, listen, there's got to be an existing curriculum out there. Let's just prescribe to that. Um, let's just bring that curriculum in. Let's not be imaginative. Let's not be authentic. Let's not home grow it. Let's just copy and paste and do it. And that's where a lot of folks have run into problems. And, and by the way, this is not impugning um, 
Facing History, the 1619 Project, um, Pollyanna, Downless Down. It, it's not that, it's just that it didn't come from the cultural milieu that the communities were in. And so I think we start with looking at what is true for our community. And that's hard. And, and I appreciate educators who have been firefighters, who have been doctors, who have been epidemiologists, who have been um, coaches, like the list goes on. The one thing that educators need now to do what you're describing well is the one piece of real estate they don't usually get, time. And where we don't have time, don't get me wrong, we need to make time. But I need to sit down with my English department and say, who are our protagonists? Who are our authors? What are the enduring understandings? What world are we introducing our students to in our classroom? What texts are necessary? What texts are superfluous? And how do we question all of our answers? I need to look at history and start to move beyond the chronicling and the datelining to look at how students develop identity, see the world, and do understand the place that they live in, understand systems of oppression, not because it's political, but because it's responsible. Like you go through disciplines and we can do that reflection, not vis-a-vis -vis an audit, not vis-a-vis -vis some outside consultant telling them what to do, though I like them very much, it's actually us home growing those answers together. And so I think the process as we're working together is to say, what makes sense K4? What makes sense 5-8? What makes sense in our high school? And then to be comfortable with the one thing that's really hard in this time is the patience <laughs> that it takes to do this well. You know, most of us in facing these work, this work and these systems and these challenges, we're trying to, do un we're trying to undo centuries in days. I don't, I don't think change likes that. And while we can be frustrated, for sure, with the pace of change, I've learned it's only genuine change that is iterative and ongoing in that way. Most communities are actually fractured by the performative microwaving of popcorn of social change, and they still found themselves in 2022 back where they were in 2020 because they didn't uh, endeavor the right process. So um, as, unsatisfied, as dissatisfying as it may be, uh, I call it iterating with excellence. Um, I, and I tell people this way, uh, baby steps to a baby are just steps. You're not babies, you're full adults. But if we take little steps, it'll make difference. So I think, I think that's, that's really important. And, and the biggest thing I'll end on, I'll turn this to Annika, is that you know, this equity leadership team is really committed, and I appreciate you all for, for making the time. You know, Jeff doesn't just kind of talk the talk. He's walking the way. He's actually sitting, but he's here is the point. Um, but you have leadership that, that's really present. Um, and you have really uh, a parent organ and garden organization who has made this so important that it was the, the centrifugal force behind their uh, first in-person gathering, which I know is a big deal. And to you friends who are online, because I know you didn't log off just yet, thank you too. But to Annika and Emily, thank you all for making time and for reading that long introduction almost two hours ago. So Annika, I'll put it back in your hands. But for all of you in the community, for your time, attention, and enthusiasm, I'm grateful. This is our first gathering, at least together but it's not our last. So I certainly look forward to talking with you all. And I believe all of my contact information is public. So um, we can certainly have conversation after this. If, you, if when you leave here after Annika dismisses you, don't go now, because then it'll, I'll feel bad because I shouldn't dismiss you. If you feel tired when you go home, just remember, I have three hours until I get to South Dartmouth and a 6.22 a.m. flight from Logan to Colorado tomorrow. So it could be worse. Annika, we'll, we'll turn the floor to you. Where'd you go? There you go. Oh, I pointed you over here. That's why Emily. There you go. Thank you. Wow. Certainly don't want to keep you too much longer, Lawrence. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it was really great uh, being here in person to feel the energy to over here and be part of some of the conversations that were happening um, and hear some of the feedback. I think it was a really valuable experience from everything that I saw and that I uh, had the benefit of participating in myself. So thank you for being here, Lawrence. Thank you all for being here as well. And if there is anyone still watching online for engaging in that way um, also. We do have some feedback forms, which we would love to hear from you all um, about how this evening was. Um, we are going to send out an electronic option for that, but if you have a few moments before heading home, 
We'll put some paper copies out on the table. Um, I know sometimes it's easier to do it before you leave the space, and since we're still a few minutes before 8 o'clock, maybe some folks can do that. So look for those out on the table. Um, you know, being here, I guess, as the representative of PTO, I would also thank those who brought some contributions for the food pantry. We have Philibus Philabelli going on this week, so um, options to donate food at the bus anytime over the course of the week. And thinking about those educators who we talked so much about tonight, um, Staff Appreciation Week is coming up next week, so plug that as an opportunity to show our support for those folks who are doing this work. Any yeah, can I, I just wanted to add, if you found this valuable, there is a recording, and I think most of us here probably found this valuable. I can, sorry. Um, spread the word that the recording is available for your friends and colleagues and whatnot so that they can also hear what happened tonight. So, Yeah, yeah and we can certainly send that out. Um, it's easily, you can easily find it through the... MSAD51 YouTube channel, um, but we will send out that link to everyone who registered as well so you have it readily available. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.